said it was for me And the signs and the words of the prophet are written on the subway walls And tenement halls whispered in the sounds of silence Father, we uh, make so much noise, we speak so many words and say nothing, and yet out of the silence you speak a word and literally say everything. And so, Lord God, I pray that you would help us to speak that word that you would speak that word to our heart this morning, that you would cause us to preach your word. So, of course, we say that in Jesus' name. Amen. I apologize for that. But that's Tim the Enchanter in the greatest movie ever made, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. And whenever I think of Elijah, I think of Tim the Enchanter. Elijah is, uh, well, some would consider him the most ancient of the people that are referred to as the prophets in Scripture. He prophesied in Israel during a time that I like to think of as the Wild West of prophecy. Uh, read First and Second Kings, and you'll see uh, what I mean. Uh, prophets telling people to do weird things, and then if they don't do it, like punch them in the face, they curse them and kill them. One prophet, teased by some little boys for being bald, then uh, curses them in the name of the Lord, and a she-bear comes out and mauls all the, these little boys, 42, 42 of them. Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord through Jeremiah, and like a hammer that breaks the rocks in pieces. The, the word is like a weapon. And in First and Second Kings, it seems that God lets some pretty immature children play with his biggest guns. That's one thing that's always bothered me about prophets. They can say the most wonderful, amazing, truly God-inspired things and then just be like total turds. I've often complained to God about this. And then he seems to remind me, yes, Peter, this is true. I let them speak my word, and I let you preach it. <laughs> well, in 1 Kings 17, 1, Elijah says to King Ahab of Israel, there shall be neither dew nor rain these days except by my word. Next verse, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. That's right, a, a walking, talking word. And the walking, talking word says to Elijah, depart, Elijah, and hide yourself. So for three years, Elijah is miraculously sustained by ravens. And a, Sido a Sidonian from Sidon, a Sidonian Gentile widow. And then after three years, the word of the Lord, the walking, talking of the word of the Lord, he tells Elijah to show himself once again to King Ahab. Ahab was married to Jezebel, the Sidonian Gentile uh, princess who had enticed Ahab into worshiping Baal, or Baal, Baal, however you say it, the fertility god, and Asherah, his consort. The worship in, that worship involved ritual prostitution in order to encourage Baal to mate with Asherah and thereby fertilize the earth. It also involved child sacrifice. And to advance the worship of Baal, Jezebel had ordered that all the prophets of Yahweh be slaughtered. 
Although Obadiah kept a hundred of them alive in two caves by feeding them water and bread. Well, in 1 Kings 18, Elijah shows himself to Ahab and challenges uh, him and the prophets of Baal to a contest on Mount Carmel. They send messages to all of Israel, to gather all of Israel, and they gather the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah. Elijah says, the God who answers by fire, he is God, and everyone agrees. The prophets of Baal lay their bull on the altar. They cry out, they cut themselves, and there is no voice, there is no answer. At noon, Elijah mocks them by literally calling out, perhaps, perhaps your God has taken a dump. Or maybe he's asleep and needs to be awakened. And they rave on, cutting themselves, bleeding all over the place from noon till three, which, interestingly enough, was the time during which the sky grew black and the earth shook as Jesus hung on the wood on Mount Calvary. But for the prophets of Baal, quote, there was no voice. Well, Elijah had taken, he had taken 12 stones and built an altar and named it Israel. He actually calls it, says, you are Israel. And on uh, this altar, on the mountain, he had placed the timbers, and on those timbers, he had placed a sacrificial offering. Elijah has the people douse the whole things with water three times, and then at 3 p.m., the time of the evening sacrifice, when Christ died, Elijah called to God saying, I have done all these things at your word. Verse 37, answer me, O Lord, answer me that your people may know. And then the fire fell. And then the people fell. And they all began crying out, Yahweh is God. Elijah and the people then slaughter all the prophets of Baal, 850 of them. Ahab then eats and drinks a sacrificial meal on the mountain. Then Elijah tells Ahab that he better get going because the rain has come in. It hasn't rained, you know, for three years. And then as the sky opens and the torrent begins to flood the parched earth with the water of life and the miraculous power of the Lord, Elijah girds his loin, tucks his robes up under his, his belt, and he runs ahead of Ahab's chariot all the way to Jezreel, 17 miles to Jezreel. He's pumped. I'm sure that Elijah was convinced that Israel would now turn back to God because God had answered by fire. Is not my word like fire, says the Lord. <laughs> Pretty awesome, don't you think? I think so. I mean, politically incorrect in a, in a few places. Slaughtering 850 prophets of a competing faith system as well as 42 boys that like to tease bold people. It helps me to remember that these people are not then endlessly tortured by their creator, but that like us, he will somehow finish them in his own image. It also helps me to remember that the word of God comes for all of us. People get so stressed about somebody dying at the hands of the Lord. We all die at the hands of the Lord. The word of God comes for all of us in the revelation. We learn that he's the reaper, and he's not, he's not grim. Well, no matter what, the word of God is awesome. It's, it's firepower, and it's no wonder that people want to speak it. And I have spoken it, and I've witnessed its power. Scripture claims that we all battle against principalities and powers, a spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. That includes Lucifer, Baal, Asherah, and myriads of demons. I think we battle them all the time. I think they constantly whisper lies into our, into our ears, into our hearts. In rare instances, due to some very graphic and intentional events, they can take control of a person's body for a time. If you've ever seen the real thing, I mean, it can just blow your mind. But what will really blow your mind is that sometimes you can speak a word that hits a demonic spirit like seriously a bullet hits a deer. It can also hit people that way. Like Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts. Like it hit the early church on Pentecost when Peter preached. It can hit like that. It can also cut and heal and transform lives. There have been times I've preached and it just felt 
felt dead. Other times I've preached and the power scared me. You know, people want the word of God and they don't want the word of God. Living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing to the division of soul and spirit. Well, 15 years ago, I was pumped. I was really pumped because I was watching the word of God deliver people from demons. I was watching the word of God build a church into a few thousand. I was expecting, I was really expecting a reformation because I preached the word. So anyway, Elijah ran to Jezreel in the power of the Lord because he was pumped. Ahab went into his palace and told Queen Jezebel what had happened, but Jezebel did not repent. Jezebel flew into a rage. In fact, she sent a messenger to Elijah saying that she had bound herself with an oath and Elijah would be dead within a day. 1 Kings 19.3, then he was afraid. And afraid, Elijah ran for his life. Commentators say this makes no sense, but I think it makes sense. I think it makes perfect sense. Ahab followed Jezebel, and Israel followed Ahab the king. Elijah expected everyone to repent at the revelation of the word, and they did not. Remember how uh, Israel sang and danced as the word of God split the Red Sea? And then they complained for 40 years, 40 years in the wilderness. Remember how Jesus heard the word, this is my beloved son, and then the Holy Spirit drove him into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. Remember how the crowds chanted, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, but when the word did not do as they expected the word to do, they chanted, crucify, crucify, crucify. Remember how in the Revelation, when we studied it, no one repents until the end of the sixth seal, uh, sixth trumpet, and sixth bowl, the edge of the seventh day. You see, I think Elijah had plans for the word. When the word failed, it terrified Elijah. But then again, maybe the word didn't fail. Maybe the word just had different plans. Maybe Elijah didn't really know the word. Verse 3, chapter 19. Then he was afraid, and he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. This is the edge of the promised land, and he left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree, and he asked that he might die, saying, It's enough now. Oh, Lord, take away my life, for I'm no better than my father's. <laughs> well, he must have thought that he was better than his father's. And now he runs for his life. And yet at the same time, he asked God to take his life. And that's what depression, despair, and suicide look like, huh? You try to save your life, and then you loathe your life, and you want God to take it away. He wants to die. You ever been there? I have. Elijah prays that God would kill him. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree, and behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. The angel of the Lord, the angel of Yahweh. Wherever it says Lord, it's Yahweh, this angel of Yahweh. There's only one of these. <laughs> Looks like a man, talks like God. This angel of Yahweh who feeds Elijah with bread and water under this tree. This God-man says the journey is too great for you, Elijah. What journey? Verse 8, and Elijah arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mount of God. There he came to a cave and lodged in it, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, the walking, talking word of Yahweh, and he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? 
I love that. Elijah spoke the word, and now the word is messing with Elijah. What are you doing here, Elijah? What is Elijah doing there? Mount Horeb, you know, is uh, the mountain of God where Moses received the Ten Commandments. This might even be the cleft in the rock where God hid Moses as his glory passed by and he proclaimed his name. It makes sense that Elijah would go back. You know, when I'm depressed, I drive by the house I grew up in and I think about my dad. It makes some sense that he'd want, you know, he'd want more instructions. More, more law. We all, we all do this. We all ask, God, what do you want me to do? The law of Moses is the word of God written in stone. It's knowledge of good and evil that you can use to try to make yourself in the image of God. It makes some sense that he'd want more firepower. When God gave the law to Moses on the mountain, he came down, remember he came down in fire. The earth trembled and there was a continual trumpet blast. Earth, wind, and fire. Maybe Elijah wants God to work for him once again, like he did on Mount Carmel. He wants the word of God to work for him, and the word asks him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah. Maybe he went there to get more words, more law, more firepower. Or maybe he went there to die. Maybe the angel sent him to the mountain to die. Elijah had prayed, take my life, for I'm no better than my father's. He, he asked to die. Not only uh, to this world, but to himself, to his own ego, Maybe the cave is a grave, and it's this journey, the journey to his own grave, the journey of his life that is too much for him. So the angel gives him bread and water under the tree so he could make the 40-day journey to his own death. <laughs> oh yeah, we're on a journey to death, right? We're on a 40-day journey to Easter called Lent. What are you doing here, Elijah, asked the word of God. Maybe he came for more words, for more laws, more direction, more firepower. Maybe he came to die. Maybe he came to live. He, he only wanted to die because he had wanted to live, right? In fact, you actually cannot die to your ego unless you want to live. That's why suicide doesn't work. What are you doing here, asked the word. Where? Did the word mean the cave on the mountain? Maybe he meant here at all. That is, Elijah, why do you exist? Do you ever feel like someone is asking you that question? What are you doing here? I think I used to hear it all the time when I had nothing to do as a child. I'd lie in the grass, look to the sky, what the ancients called heaven, and I'd ponder this question, what am I doing here? It's a wonderful, terrifying, thrilling question that I used to ponder all the time, and I think my heart knew the answer, but if I hear the question now, I might answer, what am I doing here? I'm writing a sermon, duh. I'm looking for words to change people's hearts, heal my heart and save us all. I'm looking for ways to shake the earth, make the spirit to descend and get the fire to fall. I'm busy saving the world. I've, I've, I've worked incredibly hard. Well, I feel terribly alone now and frankly, this journey that I call my life, well, it's getting to be just too much for me. You ask, what am I doing here? What are you doing here? Ask the word of God. And the angel of Yahweh. You know, I don't think it's that the word doesn't know, <laughs> right? It's that maybe we don't know. Or perhaps we have forgotten. 
Elijah said, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And the word of God said, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord, Yahweh. Now we so easily miss this, but lifnai, uh, here translated before, is a combination of the Hebrew preposition li, which is like two, and then another word fane, which is usually, or pane, pane, which is usually translated face and sometimes present. So the word of Yahweh just told Elijah to go out of this cave or cleft in the rock and stand before the face of Yahweh, the Lord God. And it was on this mountain, perhaps even in this very spot, that Moses had asked to see God's glory, and Yahweh said, I will make all my goodness pass before, Lifnai, you, and will proclaim before, Lifnai, you, my name, Yahweh, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And then Yahweh said to him, you cannot see my face, Pane, for man, Adam, may not see my face and live. So God hid Moses, you remember, in the cleft of the rock, and Moses only saw his backside. He got the law and a glimpse of God's behind. Elijah is told to go out and stand before his face. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper, a, a sound, a thin silence. Thin silence is the ESV footnote and the most literal translation, but they translate it low whisper because what the rip is the sound of silence. How could that possibly make sense? Sound, coal, Normally translated voice. So, so the most literal translation would this be this. A voice of thin, small, or sheer, skinny. A voice of thin silence. The New Revised Standard Version translates this as a sound of sheer silence. The New King James, the King James, and the RSV translate it a still, small voice. I've always wanted to hear the word of God the way my wife hears the word of God the way I think the prophets heard the word of God. You know, up to this point, Elijah had just heard the word of God because the word of God just spoke the words and he heard. He took no classes, he read no books, there was no technique, he just heard words. Sometimes my wife, just wherever, she'll just hear words. I've always wanted to hear words. And people told me that it sounded like a still, small voice, which meant that I just drove myself crazy trying to figure out which words were the stillest and the smallest. As if God could do nothing but whisper. As if he tries. People actually say this. God's trying to tell you. As if God can't do anything more than whisper. Well, up to this point, Elijah just heard words. He wasn't, he wasn't the God whisperer. Mm, I think God is telling me. One day I walked into a room and found my son Coleman with his fingers jammed in his ears, just yelling, Jesus, I can't hear you. What are you saying, Jesus, we can't hear you. I can't hear you, Jesus. See, I think someone had told him, three years old, that Jesus was his heart, and that's true. And then he sounded like a still, small voice, and Coleman wanted him to speak up. You know, once I did hear words, very crisp and clear and rather devastating in an absolutely wonderful way, and then later that same day, the Lord literally pinned me to the floor, almost broke my arms, pulled back the curtain in my mind, and I knew that the voice of God was anything but small or still. And yet, in a strange way, it was silent and by that, I mean it was not simply sound waves in the atmosphere of this world. 
You know, Jonathan is my firstborn son, and he was born after 24 hours of intense labor. When he was born, he was covered with blood and bruises. His head was smashed into a cone, and he just would not stop crying. He was utterly traumatized by the process of being born. The nurse, I remember there's this really sweet nurse. She wrapped him in a blanket. She spoke loving words to him in a soothing voice, and he still would not cry, and he still would not stop shrieking. And then she, she handed him to me, and she said, here, Talk to him. He knows your voice. And I said, Scooter. And like that, he grew silent. Immediately, he knew. He knew he was exactly where he belonged. He entered my rest and fell asleep. It shocked me. It still kind of shakes me to the core. How did he know my voice. He couldn't discern the meaning of individual words, and yet he knew my voice. How did he know my voice? He had never seen my face. He had never felt my touch, and yet he knew my voice. He knew my voice, for as I have told you, I took a black magic, indelible black magic marker and drew a big smiley face on Susan's belly. And every night, I'd put my face right next to that face, and I'd say stuff like this. Scooter? We called him Scooter because we didn't know if he was a boy or a girl, and we wanted either. So, Scooter, I'm your dad. Hope you're doing okay in there. I can't wait to meet you. I love you. Good night. Just imagine. He'd never seen my face. He'd never felt my touch. In fact, to see my face and to feel my touch, he would have had to die to that womb world, his world, and be born into into my world. That's traumatic, And, and yet now he rested in my arms because he already knew my voice. He knew my voice, for when I spoke, everything in that womb world would vibrate to the sound of my voice. He knew my voice, but my voice was not a particular thing in his world. It was bigger than his entire world. It was not a thing in his world, nor could be explained by anything in his world. And yet, he knew it. So, are there things in your world that really cannot be explained by this world? They're like, in your world, but not of this world. How about, for instance, the good? goodness or beauty you know no scientist can tell you what that is what is that how about truth how do you know that the truth is true nobody can prove truth that truth is is true yet everyone has faith in truth you say the word and people have an idea what you mean right to even say to even say there is no truth you have to assume that your statement is true How about love? Love is the opposite of this world. Love is not the survival of the fittest. Love is the sacrifice of the fittest. And when all members love, they form a body of life, a communion of love. What what is life but a whole lot of love? You see, maybe, maybe, maybe there's a face just outside your world on the other side of the Big Bang. And every day the face says, I'm your dad. Hope you're doing okay in there. Can't wait to meet you. I love you. When the face talk, everything, everything moves. And yet you cannot pinpoint a voice within the atmosphere of space and time for your dad is bigger than all of space and time. Last week I showed you this picture and said the kingdom of heaven is not simply on this timeline. And you see, uh, your father is not simply on this timeline either. In fact, he's even bigger than the entire seventh day, his kingdom. So you see, space and time themselves are like a womb, but goodness, beauty, truth, and love are the sound of something from beyond this womb of a world And the fact that you know what they are testifies to the reality that you are being made for another world. 
Martin Luther said, you know, if a baby could reason, surely it would wonder, what are these hands for? What are these eyes for? What is this mouth for? Those things have no purpose in the womb world. Have you ever wondered, what is faith for? What is hope for? If you hope for love, you see, maybe you're hoping for another world. Maybe you're being prepared for another world. And the fact that you, that, that, that you hope means that you, you already recognize the, the voice that comes from that other world, the voice of your father. You know, Jonathan actually heard the same words from the nurse, and he knew they didn't come from me because they weren't my voice. Just because you hear words, don't assume that it's the voice of your father. But now what if you did hear words, understood the words, and recognized the voice speaking those words? What if the voice said, tell Ahab to repent, or tell Peter, your husband, to stay on the path and have no fear because I am with you? If you heard words, would it mean that the voice had gotten bigger or smaller? Stronger or weaker? I mean, I used to get so stressed about hearing words, and all the while my entire world was vibrating to the sound of my father's voice saying, I love you. That's what the Lord showed me years ago when he pinned me to the floor after I told him he never spoke to me and asked him to just break my arms if I wasn't listening. I learned that God's voice is not small. And it's not weak. It creates and sustains everything that's anything. So when he speaks, everything moves. And when you hear words, you see, it's not because the voice got bigger, but because the voice got smaller. In other words, he limited himself to the little prisons that are the human words with which we each try to capture meaning. Logos in Greek. He limits himself every time he allows us to speak of him using human words. Just like he limited himself to a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger and then humbled himself even to the point of death on a tree, the voice became a word in human flesh. We took the life of the word by nailing him to a tree in a garden. We turned the living word into a dead word. That's what we do with our words and our laws and our religions. It's one thing to say the word Susan. I can control that word. I know that word. But it's quite another thing to look into the face of Susan and seeing her look back at me. It's quite another thing to be known by Susan. There was a time when Adam could look the good in his face. And then he took the knowledge of good from a tree in a garden and everything died. Love in flesh became law in stone and life was just some words. When a prophet speaks some words and yet has not listened to the voice of love, perhaps he crucifies the word. When a preacher preaches some words but hasn't listened to the voice of God, perhaps the words are accurate in some way, but dead and deadly. When a Christian tells someone about Jesus but hasn't listened to the voice of the Father, perhaps it would be better if that Christian just didn't speak. If I speak in the tongue of men and of angels, wrote Paul, if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, that's the knowledge of good and evil. If I have all faith so as to move mountains but have not love, I'm nothing. Love is the voice, and Jesus is how it sounds. Jesus is his word. So when the word became flesh and took the form of a servant, of course we took his life on a tree and we put his body in a cave on a mountain. But on the third day he rose from the dead and revealed the glory of God. We see the glory of God shining in the face of Christ, wrote Paul. He's the firstborn from the dead, 
firstborn of all creation, firstborn among many brethren and sistren, that's us. So on Good Friday, we watched our old brother, older brother leave this womb of a world, and to us it looked like death. <laughs> but in fact, he was being born. We were watching a birth from inside the womb. And on Easter, he returned testifying that God is love and his commandment is life, actually eternal life, and so he gave us his. So anyway, the word of God said to Elijah in the cave on the mountain, after they both had been uh, to the tree, go stand before the face of Yahweh. And Yahweh passed by, but he was not in earth, wind, or fire. And yet all the earth, wind, and fire was in him. And Elijah was in him. The Lord was not in earth, wind, and fire, for, but, but from beyond earth, wind, and fire, Elijah heard something. He sensed something that he could only describe as the sound of silence. Next verse. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. See, he must have gone back in the cave when the earth shook, the wind blew, and the fire fell, but he repented. He came out of the cave at the voice of silence. When Susan was in labor, I'd speak to her belly between contractions, saying, I love you, Scooter. You come on out of there. Six days you shall labor, and the seventh you will rest. It's a rhythm that ends in eternal rest. You know, I've always wanted to hear the voice of God, and I've been so afraid that I don't hear the voice of God that I just labor and labor and labor. And maybe all I need to do is stop talking. You know why I labor? You know why I look for words to move earth, wind, and fire? You know why I so often find myself talking? I think I'm trying to save you. Save me. Save my world. Save myself. For I've listened to another voice that told me God won't do it. And in fact, it's him that you need to save all of us from. So what is it that happens when we come out of the cave in which we each hide and then stand in silence before the face of I am that I am? I don't think there are words, human, human words, for all our words are the cave in which we hide, the fig leaves with which we cover our shame. So it's something you do. And yet it's purposefully doing nothing until you realize that all has been done. It's entering God's rest. Sometimes I set a timer, because that's the way I am. I get stressed about what time it is. So I set a timer, and I'd suggest maybe like 20 minutes or so. And then just do your best to stop the incessant string of words that you formulate in your brain. That's what my brain does all the time. And you can do this by focusing on like a word or a picture that reminds you of God. You could picture yourself standing at the entrance of Elijah's cave and then simply become aware of his presence. He's always present. In him we live and move and have our being. He is, I am. Be conscious of the consciousness that is always conscious of you. Breathe and remember that you are the breath of I am. I am the breath of I am who is love. Unprotected by words in the presence of love, I realize I cannot justify myself. And my ego begins to die. And yet I do not die. I begin to live in freedom. 
when I stop justifying myself, I realize that I am justified. When I stop trying to save the world, I realize that God is the Savior and that with my anxiety and my fear, I've been trying to save the world from the Savior, from, from God. When I stop trying to create myself, I realize that I am His creation. And it's finished. And lo and behold, heaven is at hand. When I stop thinking about what I have done and need to do, I can just be, which exactly where I am is now. Now is the day of salvation. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. Now is the judgment of this world, said Jesus. Now, the evil one can't stand now, and, and, and that's where I am is, and I realize I am the breath of I am. I am the manifestation of his word. When I stop speaking words, I can become the word I am. The walking, talking word of God, or at least his body. Verse 12, after the fire, a sound, a voice, a thin silence. And when Elijah heard it, the voice of thin silence, he wrapped his face in his cloak and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, that means check this out, there came a voice, a sound, same word, to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? He said, well, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only am left and they seek my life to take it away. Now this is the mind bender that modern people don't, don't seem to get in ancient stories storytellers would have gotten right away. Everything in this little dialogue, verses 13 and 14, is exactly the same as that in the dialogue at verses 9 and 10, except that it's no longer the walking, talking word of God with Elijah under the tree and in the cave that asks the question, what are you doing here? It's the voice, which clearly implies that the walking, talking word of God, who is the angel of Yahweh, is also the sound of sheer silence. And now this voice of the Creator from beyond space and time is not only with Elijah in the cave, he is the very presence of Yahweh in Elijah as he walks out of the cave into a new life. I'm saying the cave is a grave. And the grave is a womb. And the word is a seed from the voice beyond space and time. And so Elijah was just born from above. And now Elijah will not only speak the word of God, he will be who he is, the word of God that is spoken. What are you doing here? Ask the sound of silence. You know what I think we're doing here? I think we're observing our own birth. <laughs> I think we're observing our own creation, so we will endlessly, or a better way to say that is, end fully enjoy ourselves, the image and likeness of I am that I am, so that we will forever enjoy the face of our Father and rest in His arms, for we will know that we do not create ourselves. <laughs> but that we are constantly created by grace, the love that creates all things. And so you see, it's through faith, which means trust. It's through faith that we rest in the arms of grace and become who we truly are. And faith cometh by hearing the voice of thin silence. Don't know if I said that right. <laughs> I don't know if I can say that right. But 14 years ago, I'd spoken the word, and the word was fire. I'd watched it bind, literally bind Satan, reveal glory, and grow a church into thousands. In my mind, everything was set for a reformation. All was going according to plan. I was pumped until someone said something to another person at the presbytery of my denomination, and some folks came and said, hey, hey, God can't make all things new. 
You can hope, but you must publicly confess it's impossible or lose your ordination. Leaders at my church didn't know what to say to our people. They couldn't really argue that the word was wrong, for that's why people had come, and that's what they read in their Bibles. And so they started to say, well, Peter's wrong. I mean, we really can't say how he's, how he's wrong. We, but just know, just, you just need to know that something is wrong with Peter. At my last board meeting, I begged them to tell me what they thought was wrong with me, and at last they did. Some of you were, were maybe there. Alan, we were talking about this. You were there watching. They went around the room one after another for about an hour. One would say my leadership was weak. Another would say that my leadership was strong, too demanding. And I'm sure it was both. One would say I criticized President Bush, and the next would say, well, you didn't criticize President Bush enough. Some of the things they said must have been true, and I'm sure some were false, but in the end, I had no words. I just went down to my office, the lowest room in the church. I turned off the light, and then I curled up under my desk in the fetal position, alone in the dark. I don't know how long I laid there, but it was a long time. I thought I was dying, but now I know that I was being born. That's a picture of my cave. But I know that each of you also has a cave. And so you can tell the very same story. Sometimes when I feel far from God, that's the thing I picture in silence. I picture myself in the dark, curled up in the fetal position under my desk, and I picture Jesus, the walking, talking word of God, lying there with me, alone, together. Then after a time, I get up, leave the cave, and go to work. Verse 15, And the Lord said to Elijah, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria, and Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel-Meholah, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. You see, Elijah will still speak words, but he'll begin to speak them, I think, in, in a new way. He's no longer telling the story, using the words that God gives him, he is the story that God is telling, almost like the incarnation of the word. And if you know the rest of the story, you know that this is not, absolutely not Elijah's plan. It had been going according to plan up until this point, but this is not Elijah's plan. Elijah's told to anoint Hazael, king of Syria, and Hazael will, quote, rip open the pregnant women of Israel and dash their babies to pieces. In other words, bad will go to worse. Israel will fall. Then Judah will be taken captive to Babylon. Even, even with the words of God written on stone, none of them could justify themselves in the sight, the face of God. So bad will go to worse, worse to absolute worse. But when we do our absolute worst, God reveals his very best, his glory, his face. So for the next 880 years, Israel continued to build an altar on Mount Zion until the walking, talking word of God carried his wood, his timber up that mountain, and there Israel took the life of the word of God on a tree in a garden, but the word of God had already given his life to all of us the night before. He took bread, and he broke it, saying, this is my body, my story given to you. Take and eat. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and he said, this is the covenant, eternal covenant in my blood. 
poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, and do it in remembrance of me. Now, he gave this to 12 guys, living stones, a new Israel upon which he would build his new Jerusalem, his temple, his body, the body of the word. On Pentecost, the fire fell, and you remember they began to preach the word. It's the same word, I think, but they're beginning to preach it in a new way. And so now, to you, the angel of Yahweh says, the journey is too much for you. But it's not too much for me. You know, he fed Elijah with bread and water. Check it out. He's turned the water into wine. And so I invite you to come take the bread and the wine or the juice can come and take it back to your seat and just be still. Be still and know that I am is God. Then place the, place the word in your cave. The cave is a grave but the grave is a womb. For the one that's with you in that cave is the promised seed. And now you're beginning to understand that you are the word that I am is speaking. Amen. Now my sermon was already too long, but sit down, because I have to tell you one more fascinating little tidbit about Elijah, because it's important. He didn't die. How's that? Uh, Elijah didn't die. If you know the story, um, he, he goes on, he anoints Elijah, and he and Elijah walk along. They cross the Jordan River, and uh, suddenly this flaming chariot and these flaming horses, they come down to the sky. They separate Elijah from Elijah. That's judgment. And then the flaming chariot takes Elijah away. It's really cool when you read about it because they're so stressed about this that the prophets, they send search parties out looking for Elijah because they think maybe the Spirit threw him out of the chariot and they would find him dead somewhere on some mountain. And 880 years later, Elijah does show up on a mountain in the promised land with Moses and the transfigured walking, talking Word of God who is now shining like the sun because he is the face of of Yahweh. You see, Elijah didn't die because he already died at the entrance to the cave on Mount Horeb where he stood before the face of God. But Moses, Moses, remember, he did die. He died and went to his fathers in Sheol, which is sometimes translated hell. So if he showed up on the Mount of Transfiguration, that means someone went and got him. Well, Moses also saw God on Mount Horeb, but you see, not his face, only his backside. So Moses still needed to die the second death, the death of death in order to live his eternal life. Well, if you believe in Jesus, you're like Elijah. Your body will die, but you, your soul, your psyche, won't die. Why? Why? Well, because you already lost it and found it in Jesus. That's why he said, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. <laughs> See, I think that's good news. And if you love the people around you, and they're depressed and sad, and they say to you, I want to die. Well, you can preach good news to them. You can say, well, let's do it now. <laughs> let's stand before the face of our Father, the Lord Jesus, and just give him everything. So stand up, would you? Stand up, and I'm going to commission you. In the name of Jesus, 
preach the word. Amen.